Okay, um, so next we talk about gene regulatory network. Uh, you know, gene expression really depends on transcription factors and also the, the, the nuclear state, as we mentioned, um, depending on whether this region is open, uh, the transcription factor might be able to bind to some of the transcription factor motifs, but won't be able to bind to other transcription factor motifs that if they are in the kind of the closed chromatin or compartment B regions, right? Um, and, um, it, and, and then the collection of all the transcription factors will determine the overall chromatin state. And uh, the overall chromatin state will determine how a particular transcription factor is able to bind and regulate which genes. And over time, people have accumulated a lot of transcription factor chip seek data, and they kind of start to see how a specific transcription factor are interacting with different, uh, different genes. Um, if we look at E. coli, E. coli didn't have too many genes. There are 200 transcription factors. Uh, I suspect this is still an underrepresentation, but you just get the ballpark. Um, there are, you know, 4,000 at least annotated genes that are being regulated by the 200 transcription factors, um, but there are a very limited number of known interactions. And very often, as long as the transcription factor is binding, so for example, in this case, the Y is a protein, but also a transcription factor. If it binds to the promoter of another gene, and this gene X, this gene X will be regulated by protein Y. It's a kind of a pretty easy case of just having things on and off, right? So this is the network that people know about the E. coli regulatory network. I mean, it looks complicated, but not that complicated. Uh, but if you look at human gene regulation, this is from a, a recent paper on this, based on their knowledge, you can already see, um, first of all, human has a lot more transcription factors, there are a lot more genes, and also their interactions are, are also much more complicated. And uh, when they look at uh, how, you know, based on chip seek data, you, you want to see what kind of regulation happened. There are, are, are uh, different type of what they call network motifs, you know, how they regulate each other. For example, uh, in this case, X is regulating Y, Y is regulating Z, and X is also regulating Z. Or X is inhibiting Y, Y is activating Z, and X is also inhibiting Z. And so you can see there are these type of uh, uh, patterns that are recurrently used when you have a gene module of how you know one regulating another or another another. So um, network motif is to look at this particular gene regulatory network. By the way, um, depending on the experiment you have, if you have a transcription factor chip seek data, you can know the direction of the arrow because the transcription factor is usually pointing to the genes that it binds uh, uh, near the so if, if X is a transcription factor and it has many binding sites near gene Y, then the arrow is pointing from X to Y, right? Um, and so from those, you know, enough of this gene expression co-regulation and then chip seek data, you can see this type of co-occurring patterns where uh, genes use to regulate each other. Um, there are some single input modules, for example, this one transcription factor can regulate many other genes. But there are also, I think for E. coli, you probably see more of the left, but in human, you see a lot of situations like the right. It's many transcription factors working together to regulate many, many other genes. And that's why um, human didn't have too many uh, more genes than C. elegans or fly but our regulation can be much more complicated. It's through, you know, this multiple transcription factor regulating multiple genes, we can create these type of um, much more complex regulation patterns. So um, one quick example of this, you know, how can a network motif help us to regulate uh, gene expression to have the desired output? Um, for example, if you have an input, which is uh, some external conditions, it could be a nutrient, it could be a hormone, it could be some stimulus, right? And so you can see here, um, the initial input is X. Uh, this may not really be, uh, or sorry, um, that initial X is, is the, sorry, initial input is the 
could be the signal. It may not even be the transcription factor, but imagine it comes in bursts, right? Sometimes it comes in a very short time, but sometimes it will be stable, coming in much, much stronger. And what you have is, why is directly being regulated by X? Well, whereas um, you need another signal which has both X and Y in order to activate Z. And you can see how Z is being regulated. For example, uh, <clears throat> when um, X is a very sharp signal, once it's come in, uh, this gene Y is being activated, right? Uh, uh, it has a little delay because um, even though it detected X, by the time Y is transcribed and is uh, translated to make a protein, there is a delay. But you know, by the time Y is being made, the X signal is gone. And so it, it gradually <clears throat> the Y transcription and the translation will stop. Um, and because this Y is a slight delay, Z actually did not get activated because the signal is sharp. Z does not need to get activated in this case. Whereas um, in another situation, when you have a stimulus that lasts a very long time, so the signal X is there, uh, the Y, even though there is a slight delay, eventually you will have enough of the Y signal, and when X and Y are both available, a Z will become activated. And in this case, the, the Z signal can also last a little longer because uh, you know, by the time X stop, Y will start to decrease, but it will take a little delay before Z detected the, the, the oh, sorry, um, the, 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 the Z signal gradually decreased because when the signal is not there, protein degradation also takes some time. And so you can see here, even though the input um, is just zero and one, depending on whether the, the signal comes in short or long, you can have Y and Z with slightly different behavior. Uh, one is more uh, sensitive to a, a sharp signal, whereas the other one is more, uh, it, it's only activated when you have a stable signal, right? So you can see this network motif is kind of a <coughs> control theory to help uh, genes being regulated with different behavior. Um, and you can also see a situation when one gene is regulating multiple other genes, but depending on the activation threshold, <coughs> and you can control the time they get activated and also the time they, they, they is they stops, right? So um, that's another situation. Using different activation threshold, you can also control the output. And then when you combine these two together, you know, using multiple inputs, using these feed forward loops, and also using the activation threshold, you can have much, much more uh, complicated gene regulation behavior. Um, yeah, so that's why when people look at now the transcription factor binding in human, there are many, many factors binding in different locations in the cell, uh, in the, in the, uh, on the chromatin. And they very often, you can have one transcription factor binding to thousands or tens of thousands of uh, regions in the genome. But depending on whether other transcription factors are present, whether the same transcription factor is binding at low level or high level, whether that's transient or stable binding, it will have very different behavior on how it regulates the nearby genes. And I would say for this, even though we have a lot of ChIP-seq and a lot of gene expression, in terms of really understanding all the gene regulation models, we are still in the early days. We're still accumulating a lot more data uh, over time. Okay, so um, the summary is that long-range chromatin interactions are very important. Uh, they are maintained by the 3D uh, genome structure or the chromatin structure of the 3D genome. And if we look at higher order chromatin interactions, um, you have in the very big picture, the A compartment, which is usually active, and the B compartment, uh, usually both on the nuclear uh, membrane and also in the nuclear center. And they are more closed, right? So that's the very big picture. And then when you zoom in, you will see those triangles of uh, chromatin interaction uh, tad or topologically associating domains where the loops are happening more frequently within. And then you can look at the specific promoter enhancer loops, which are little dots in, uh, the, in the 3D map. Although, as we mentioned, the current technology, most of these dots happen to be CTCF 
which are the loop anchors, we haven't been able to get a very high resolution promoter enhancer loops yet at the current technology level. Um, and also uh, with the complex gene regular regulation network um, that maintains certain motifs to really create a dynamic systems which much more interesting dynamically regulated uh, um, gene modules and behavior. Okay, um, do we have questions about this? Uh, Tara, one question. Yeah. Maybe it's kind of like long. Like, can you go back to the slide where you talk about like uh, equality of visibility, like normalization of matrix? Ah. Uh, it, it's, it's a long one. <laughs> I see. Um, maybe I'll stop this recording. Well, um, it's okay. Uh, so basically, that part is just to make sure, hold on, make sure, oh, sorry. Uh, not even there. This part, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, this is just to make sure that you can correctly adjust for any potential bias in the high C map because some regions are just easier to sequence or for some reason you just happen to see a lot. And even though they are interacting with too many, many other regions, you, you, want, to, you want to at least um, give it a fair representation. This is to make sure in big chunks of the chromatin, you're, you're giving it roughly similar representations. Yeah, so what does this figure D mean? Uh, like... ah, so if you only look at count, Right. how many counts you have uh, between one region and another region. So if, if uh, X are all the regions and Y are also all the regions, you want to see how often you see X and Y interacting with each other, right? If you just look at the counts, sometimes looking at the raw counts, you will see a streak of either a streak of rows or a streak of columns. And that could be because of even like a the sequenceability, GC content, or some technical biases. But there are also real interactions. Um, so we want to make sure that we normalize the data well enough so that roughly uh, we, are, we, are, we are not just seeing the biases. Yeah, yeah, OK. OK. All right, so that's good for today. I think actually this remote teaching works pretty well, huh? So hope everybody Stay safe, stay healthy. Um, homework three, sorry, homework four is due uh, this coming weekend. And we're gonna continue to run the lab remotely. And the TA will also have more office hours on Zoom um, in case you have questions. Okay, um, we are still waiting from Harvard to decide. We, we can definitely make this course pass and fail. Uh, I think Harvard is gonna reduce the requirement for the course, but whether they want to make the whole course, like all the Harvard courses pass and fail, we're still waiting for registrars to make a decision. But if you want to take this course pass fail, I'm okay. We can, we can give you permission for that. Okay? So stay safe. Bye.